group 331 here today, as you can probably see everybody here. Do you guys want to come down to the front and lead us in the pledge tonight? Come on you can come down to the front row. I know Trustee Marisek just got done showing you guys and girls all around Village Hall. They know all about water systems. Perfect. That's how it's supposed to go. So thank you for coming tonight. And um, we'll all turn and face flag. And if you guys want to start us off on the pledge. <coughs> Awesome, thank you. And before you go anywhere, do you guys want to come in front here and we'll take a picture? All right, so I'm going to kind of jump out of order on the, under this first portion. I'm going to go on to item C and the swearing in of police officer. President Gina. Riley, do you want us to take the roll? Oh, yeah. We okay. actually should start the meeting, right? <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Geyer. Here. Trustee Sperling. Here. Trustee Lee. Here. Trustee Betzinger. Here. Trustee Youngerman. Here. And Trustee Marisek. Here. Awesome. Thank you, Penny. All right. And now we'll move on to item C, uh, swearing in of our newest police officer, Chief. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board, uh, guests. Um, I have a special honor tonight of introducing the newest Montgomery police officer, um, Officer Gina Galanis. Uh, Gina is a Montgomery resident. Yeah. Um, she was raised here by her mom, Sophia, with her sister, Stacy, who's in her audience. Um, <coughs> Gina, her father's name is George. She has been a resident since 1999. She graduated from Oswego East High School. She also graduated, graduated excuse me, with a major in psychology from Aurora University. She's got a minor in criminal justice. Um, she's also fluent in Greek. Yeah. Gina's hobbies are cooking, baking, and CrossFit. Um, she previously worked for the University, Aurora University Police Department. Uh, which is where we stole her from. She graduated from the police academy in September. Um, she likes romantic comedies, and her favorite color is blue. Um, it's funny, because at the Halloween Fest, her sister Stacy told me she's always wanted to be a Montgomery police officer since the age of seven, correct? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you to Gina Galanis. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I Gina do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that, I will support the Constitution of the United States that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Illinois and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of police officer to the best of my ability. Uh, so you want to invite your mom up to come pin your badge on, correct?
Come on up for a picture. You can't ask the question. You just got to tell them to come up, right? <laughs> Command presence. There you go. All right, I'll let you guys get in close there. Yeah, you gotta oh, send yeah. her around the horn. She, she will. I want to go shake everybody's hand. Here, I can hold that for you. <laughs> this always happens. Good stuff. Very kind. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you all. At this um, point, I do have one other item I did want to insert in here. So Director uh, Wolf, you have a quick introduction. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I don't have the quite as formal introduction that the Chief did, but I would like to introduce tonight uh, Andy Jackson. Uh, Andy is our newest member of our Public Works Department. Uh, Andy comes to us from uh, working in the uh, maintenance division for School District 129. So he is the newest addition to our uh, team. He is a street uh, maintenance worker in our street division of Public Works. So we're excited to have Andy as part of our team and look forward to his contributions. All right, so move back up to uh, item B on the agenda. That's our public comment period. Uh, this is a two minute opportunity for any member of the public to address the board on any topic. If you would like to, you can come down to the podium. Usually survey the room to see if anybody looks interested. Don't want to cut anybody off. All right, hearing none, we'll go ahead and move on um, to item D. And I, uh, Brad and uh, Gina. Jenna, and if you could pronounce your last name so I don't butcher it. Uh, Connectus. Connectus. And uh, Jenna, Mickey, with the Sugar Grove Library District, you guys want to come on up? Thank you, Mr. President. I'll speak first, uh, and then uh, after about five minutes, so I'll turn over to Jenna. Our presentation will be no longer than about eight or nine minutes total. Okay. And thank you for the, again for the opportunity. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Okay, so I am uh, Brad Connectus. I am president of the Sugar Grove Public Library District Board of Trustees. And again, appreciate the opportunity to present to the, uh, the Village of Montgomery Board, uh, as well as of course the members of uh, the public that have uh, attended this evening. And th thought we'd just share some information about the, the library in, in the interest of uh, intergovernmental uh, coordination at the municipal level, just so there's kind of open communication and let you know what the library's up to. Uh, so a little bit about myself first. Uh, I bought my home in the Village of Montgomery in 2017. Uh, I was appointed to uh, a vacant position on the library board in 2018 and was elected uh, in 2019 and currently serve as the, the president. Uh, my first child was just born a couple weeks ago at the beginning of the month. So we have that uh, bundle of joy uh, on our plate as well. <laughs> Uh, and my, my theme for the presentation along with Jenna here is uh, that uh, our library district is the heart of our community. We think of it as, as the living room of the community in which we serve. Um, and this presentation is kind of like a, a physician's report, if you will, if you, if you follow me on that heart analogy. Uh, so 
Uh, I'll give you the, the overview of the, uh, the mission of our library. We're a unique resource to often offer open access to information that fosters a passion for reading, learning, and the exchange of ideas. We support democracy, citizenship, and cultural growth. Uh, our district is about 40 square miles within Kane County. We are not a municipal library. We are a library district, uh, which includes parts of the Village of Montgomery, most notably the Fairfield Way and Foxmoor uh, developments uh, east of, um, uh, excuse me, west of Route 30. Um, we, have, of course, include Sugar Grove and unincorporated areas uh, of, of the, uh, the township and, and unincorporated Kane County as well. Uh, our, our governance, uh, we have seven elected board positions. We serve four-year terms uh, with no compensation. Uh, a little bit of the history of our district. In 1963, we became a tax-supported institution and our, uh, our tax rate was established. Uh, for, the, for several decades, we operated out of the township building in Sugar Grove and we were briefly in a community house, which was about a 6,000 square foot facility with a low ceiling. We felt a little cramped. Uh, in 2004, uh, our voters voted yes to an $8 million construction bond uh, serviced over 20 years. And we opened our current facility in 2009. Uh, the facility is a 24,000 square foot uh, facility located at 125 South Municipal Road. Uh, a little bit about the strengths and challenges of, uh, of, of our library. Um, so we have a, a very dedicated part-time staff. Uh, we rely heavily on friends and volunteers and donations. Um, annually, we have about 1,680 volunteers, uh, volunteer hours, uh, supporting beautification, programming, and shelving books. And that equates to about 32 hours per week. So that's about one headcount uh, in addition to our, our library staff. So that's very important, uh, those volunteer efforts. Um, our, we have an attractive new facility in an inspiring, uh, kind of an aspiring aesthetic, kind of similar to the high raised ceiling here if, if you've been in, in, in our facility. Um, and it's very centrally located within the district. Uh, we have very good service trends uh, uh, in terms of visitors, circulation of materials, and donations. All those uh, grow year over year. So we have good trends there. Uh, and we know that uh, libraries are very important uh, of course, um, to, our, to our community. Our challenges, uh, first and foremost, is funding. Uh, we are, we're currently uh, about 52% of our annual operating budget is, uh, is, is uh, servicing our bonds, which again expire in 2024. Um, since 2000, uh, since uh, 2004, when the bond was passed, um, there have been a couple efforts to, uh, uh, or a couple campaigns to, um, uh, increase the, the limiting rate and voters have uh, voted down those measures. Um, so our, essentially our, uh, our, um, our rate has been unchanged since 1963. Um, uh, as a result of that, we do have reduced operating hours. We're, we're uh, open six days per week, about 50 hours per week. Uh, we are closed on Fridays. Um, and of course, um, just kind of looking ahead over the next couple years um, with some of the uh, looming wage pressures from recent Springfield legislation, we do have to consider that uh, as we uh, research ways to, to remain uh, uh, financially viable over the next few years. So uh, just something to keep in mind as, as we plan ahead. Um, I'm gonna turn over at this point to uh, our assistant director of the library, Jenna, to go into a little more details of some of our uh, initiatives, a little more detail of our financials, and some of our upcoming events. And then at the end of her presentation, uh, we'll go into a, a minute or two for Q&A. So thank you again. Jenna? All right, let's test. Okay, I'm used to being quiet, right? That's the stereotype. <laughs> okay, so my name is Jenna Mickey. As Brad said, I'm the assistant director at the Sugar Grove Library. I've been there for it'll be five years this January. So I've definitely been there to see the excitement of all of our patrons. They're loving our services. They want more, more, more all the time. That's what we hear. So I did want to cover what we would love to do if we had um, the ability to, the, the value that we want to be able to provide that we can't right now. So we'd love to be open on Fridays. As Brett said, we're open 50 hours a week. Most nearby libraries, including your um, Oswego branch of Montgomery, are open 72 hours. So significantly lower. 
be here all the time. We want to come on Friday, so we'd love to be able to do that. Um, we want to expand our programming, so we'd love to be able to have a creator studio or a maker space with those um, high-tech gadgets, like a 3D printer, large poster makers, green screen, recording equipment. That is keeping on trend with what libraries are doing now. We would love to be able to provide more assistive technologies, so speech to text, um, screen readers, text readers, capabilities built into all of our technology on site to help people that need it. We have a library of wonderful things collection, so those are items that are not books. <laughs> we currently circulate things like an Oculus Go, a Wi-Fi hotspot, a um, waffle maker, a ukulele, a keyboard. So patrons are currently loving that. We'd love to be able to keep expanding that, offering tools that help the community. Resource sharing. We want to be able to do more homebound delivery. So for the mobility impaired, being able to drop off books and have those interactions to site locations where we can't currently get there because we don't have the staff or time to. So that would be another expansion goal of ours. And just in general, more programs. I've had two people this week ask me for specific programs. We've had teens asking for more after school clubs, adults wanting more lectures and programming and um, performers and uh, homeschool initiatives we find are very uh, in demand right now. So just in general, <laughs> we would like to be able to expand our hours and our programming and finally, we'd also want to retain more of our staff. We have great friendly staff. It's what are known for in our community. We always get feedback that we're a friendly, welcoming environment. And that is really our staff that's driving that. But because all the positions are part-time with no retirement or life insurance, uh, not life insurance, but health insurance, um, we, we can't retain staff the way we would like to. So that would be another initiative of ours. And then stewardship, of course, of the programming that we currently offer, which is vibrant and, and great. And we have packed programs all the time. So we want to be able to keep that going. So those are just a, some of our ideas for what we would like to do, more values that we'd like to provide to the community, if we could, with a bigger budget. So what is our budget? <laughs> it is 1.3 million. 95% of that is levied through taxes. 5% is from grants and fundraising and fee initiatives. Expenditure-wise, 53% sure, of our operating budget goes towards our building bond, our mortgage. That's leaving us with a precious few dollars. <laughs> so we have 28% of our expenditures for staff, 14% for facilities and administration, and 6% for our materials and programs. So we, let me see here, we are currently finishing up our strategic plan that goes through 2020. We're looking to develop our next strategic plan for 2021 through 2025. So once we have some of those planning sessions, we would love to invite you, um, give your feedback on what you're looking for to, to into the future of the library. <laughs> so let me see here. I, we do have an annual report and we'll make that available to you guys. Um, we'll pass it around at the end. But we will have an online feature for this as well so that you'll be able to share it with your community. We invite you to, to be on our Facebook. We do share a lot there. <laughs> and have other government administrations sharing our news as well. So once we have that, we'd love to have you share it with your community. Um, so just a couple of the numbers, the highlights from this annual report. We've had 75,000 vi visits in the last year, 456 programs, and our library offers 1.5 million resource items, books, movies, music, wonderful thing items. Um, so we have a lot to offer the community. We have great attendance at our programs and that is evident in the numbers. <laughs> so a couple other things I'd love to cover with you are just some upcoming events that I'd love to invite you to for the rest of the year. We have our Indie Author Day that's coming up on Saturday, November 16th. 
It is going to be 25 local authors that are inside the library and they'll each have their own table with their published works. You can go visit and explore when you're here. Again, that's the 16th. And then we have the library board meeting on Wednesday, November 20th at 6.30 p.m. And then our final large event of the year, closing out 2019, is gonna be the Holiday in the Grove. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a initiative through the whole Sugar Grove. Different locations have events going on. So our location <coughs> hosts the um, Keeneland High School Madrigals performance, the Keeneland Youth Orchestra, and the Carter Middle School Jazz Band. So we have some local schools that come to perform, but we also have crafts and programs and bingo going on for families. So it's a really fun event throughout the whole community and we have events going on specifically at our location. So indie author, board meeting, holiday in the Grove, we'd love to see you at one or all of those. But thank you so much again for your time today and for listening about the Sugar Grove Public Library. Do you have any questions? And now what's the date on Holiday in the Grove? It's the seventh, the first Saturday of the December? December. Thank you. It's always the first Saturday every year, so it's the seventh, I believe. Do you have a time for that? Um, our library opens at 10, and we'll have events throughout the day. Performances for music are bookended throughout the day, and it depends on the age group you're coming there for, because we'll do holiday story times early in the morning, so. Those were really easy questions. Mine might be a little harder. Do you know okay. roughly what percentage the Foxmore and Fair Fairfield make up of the total district? Good question, So um, I looked up, I was trying to get some of that information yeah. and I'm happy to follow up with you. We have 8,500 card holders. We haven't drilled down which cities they live in. I don't okay. know if we can, we can probably do Montgomery breakdown. We just. So the uh, the total, have it in front of me. the total population within our, our service district is about fifteen thousand seven hundred. Yeah. So if you happen to know off the top of your head what the total population of those two uh, sub developments are, I, I don't. But I bet somebody over there might be able to guess. <laughs> Four thousand. I was going to say four to five thousand. I don't know exactly, but we can give you that number. That was my guess. Was going to be in that ballpark. So every house that's there is eligible to be a card holder, just not necessarily do they have one or not right now. Three members of our seven member board are actually residents of that neighborhood, myself Perfect. included. I like that, I like to hear that. <laughs> so, I have a um, question. Go ahead. If I'm, on, uh, your operating budget was $1.3 million. What's the approximate levy on a $250,000 house then? I'm sorry, you wanted the levy number, the yeah, not the when, bond. If, I, if I'm a resident of Fairfield and Foxmoor, I'm, I'm not, I, I live on the other side of 30, but um, what is the approximate levy each year for your library district? Um, we, I mean, we can't just levy. We have to, our, we're, in, we're capped at the consumer price index, 1.9% every year. I don't but is it, if, it, if I have a $300,000 home, is it, about 300 bucks, 400 bucks. I think it's less than that. I think it's sort it? of like 150, 200, somewhere in there. It's definitely less than that. Less than the 300. You guys are doing a lot more with your money and with taxpayer money than the library district on my side at 30. Because um, it's double that and they don't have nearly those type of events. So good job. Thanks, we, we like to call ourselves a scrappy, friendly little team, so <laughs> <laughs> thanks for supporting us. <laughs> How many uh, people do you have on your Friends of the Library Committee? It's a little bit informal. They don't have formal gatherings. Um, they help with our pancake breakfast that Which we just was had. Which this past Saturday, actually. <laughs> um, and they do booths. They're now gonna be doing a, um, every Saturday from 10 to one, it's free coffee with the Friends and there will be other vendors available selling goods, but the friends will offer coffee. They don't have a set number, I don't think, but at least a dozen. Sorry, every, every, every yeah, they're testing it out. They okay. just, we just did their second one last Saturday, and the vendors uh, did really well, and they wanna come back and offer that service, because we have a cafe space that's vacant, so they're trying to gotcha. provide that a fun environment. That should be your worker bee people. And that, that's the ones you gotta get more of and get them yeah, better so organized. We just started, um, 
I don't know if the papers are fully finalized yet, but our um, Sugar Grove Foundation, so now we'll have the Friends and the Foundation, um, and they're gonna help with more initiatives for building up more gift giving and corporate giving revenue and things for us. like that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Appreciate the time. We'll you Thank soon. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Did you say you had the yep. stuff to pass out? Perfect. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. That's okay. We can share. <laughs> we'll get. We'll hand them out. All right, now the, we'll move on to the moment you've all been waiting for, the presentation of our audit. Applause. Hey. All right, go ahead, Director <laughs> Ben Moore. Thank you, President Brawley. Uh, at this time, I will turn it over to Jamie Wilkie. Uh, she is the partner on the Village's audit. Thank you, good Thanks evening. Um, I believe you all have the very large document in front of you, so the goal tonight will be to kind of break that document down uh, certainly address any specific questions that you all might have as well. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Justin and his team. Uh, the audit is a six-month process, truly, from start to finish. Uh, so we do come out right at the end of the fiscal year and talk about planning. Uh, we then go into our testing phase of the audit and then into draft and review phase and ultimately this evening the final presentation of that document. Uh, certainly that six month process does not happen without the coordinated efforts, um, particularly of the finance department. Uh, we certainly come into a very well prepared um, package as far as the audit goes. Uh, you know, most government engagements, we do expect to come in and have a good handful of adjusting journal entries. Uh, Justin works very hard to make sure that's not the case here in Montgomery. So overall, a very clean audit process. So thank you to you and your team. I do want to point out a couple of page number references as we go through. So we'll start with the larger bound document with the orange cover. And our first stop will be page 13 of that document. Page 13 provides what we call the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. This is a copy of last year's award. Just a reminder, this is another third-party independent review of the annual audited financial statements and really the highest level reporting that we can have for any government entity. Uh, so there is a rather stringent checklist uh, that we do have to adhere to as far as financial reporting requirements. And so the village has met those requirements and we have included a copy of that award for last year. Uh, we will be again submitting the document for the current fiscal year to the program and we would obviously anticipate receipt of that award again. Immediately after that, you'll find on pages 14 and 15, the independent auditor's report uh, being that we had a clean audit process, we have issued a clean audit opinion or what we call an unmodified opinion. That is the highest level opinion that we can issue. That means the financial statements as presented are materially correct. With any government engagement as part of that audit process, we are required to assess the internal control environment. So while we are not providing a full opinion on internal controls for the village, we are required to assess that control environment. Uh, so that does include pretty extensive testing, uh, confirmation of external balances um, with banking institutions, attorneys, um, debt holders, et cetera. So there is a rigorous process that we do go through. Um, and certainly if there were any red flags, issues, or findings, we would have to bring those forth to the board this evening. And I'm happy to report there are no such findings. So again, a very clean audit process. 
Immediately after the audit opinion on pages 16 through 28, you'll find a very important section of the document, which is what we call management's discussion and analysis. Um, as time has gone on, the document has gotten longer and longer, it seems, as the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, or GASB, has been active with new mandates. Um, so this section of the report really has become more important over time. It does serve as the executive summary to the audit, and it is, in fact, prepared by management. Um, so this is really management's internal discussion of the overall trends and results for the fiscal year. I do always encourage our boards to read this section in detail. It is really a wealth of information, kind of condensed into a manageable amount of pages. So again, that's included on pages 16 through 28. A couple of key notes that you'll see within some of the highlights or discussion points. Um, overall, as with most of our municipal clients, we did see a rebounding in things like sales tax and income tax for the year. Um, I think most of our finance departments um, were a little hesitant to be ultra aggressive with that budgeting on those revenues, um, especially in light of the state of Illinois, you know, over time holding some of those shared revenue streams. So um, overall, that was to the good that those did, in fact, exceed budget for the year. And overall, cost controlling measures, particularly in the general fund, um, which allowed that general fund to have a surplus for the current fiscal year. Uh, the ending balance in that general fund represents about 43% of operating expenditures, or just around five months. Um, so the village ended the year within your minimum three month requirement for that fund balance in the general fund, okay? And I do want to point out the budgetary comparison schedule then for the general fund. You'll find that on page 101 of the document, so we'll flip quite a bit here. The top half of that section will provide the revenue analysis compared to budget, um, and that's where you'll see some of those state shared revenues exceeding those budgetary expectations, uh, particularly sales tax and income tax. Uh, the other revenue of note on page 101 is really interest income. So obviously the rebounding in the financial market certainly has a positive impact for the village as well. The bottom half of the section on page 101 will provide the expenditures in comparison to budget. Um, overall, those were about 1% under budget in total for the fiscal year. And that ultimately towards the bottom of the page on page 101 then generates the surplus that we have reported for the current fiscal year. The last section of the document I'd like to point out starts on page 165 and it begins what we call our statistical section. The statistical section will take you through the very last page of the document and really there is a wealth of information as well in this part of the report. Uh, the goal here is really to provide all kinds of 10-year trend information. So the first several schedules will focus on financial trends, so starting on page 165. As you continue to work your way through that section of the document, you'll also find 10-year trend information with regards to property tax history, uh, long-term debt history, uh, wealth of operating indicators, such as number of employees, um, capital assets, et cetera. So I do always encourage our boards as well to maybe spend a little time starting on page 165, uh, and you'll really get a lot of nice historical context as you review kind of the results for the current fiscal year. The second document you have in front of you is what we call our management letter. The management letter is our opportunity on an annual basis to provide what I would call any best practice recommendations or general updates. I'm happy to report we have no new recommendations for this year. So we have provided in that document the update to the three prior recommendations that have been provided to the village. Um, I will briefly go through those, but certainly there's updates provided within the bound document. Uh, number one, the village was required to implement a new standard um, by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. That is called GASB 75. Uh, GASB 75 related to how we are required to report our post-retirement health care costs. Um, so there was a mandate that required that we engage the services of an actuarial firm to help 
quantify the potential liability to the village when we have retirees who under state statute are in fact allowed to piggyback on the village's health insurance plan. Um, so the village did engage those services and went through a process to provide census data and ultimately determine that liability calculation. Um, so you are fully in compliance and we have addressed that statement. Um, there was a liability that was required to be reported on the books um, and I can certainly give you a page number reference for that in the documents. You can see the breakdown of that. Bear with me, I apologize. Uh, that is on page 100. So after that analysis, we were required to put about a $5.2 million long-term, so this is a non-cash liability on the books for the village. The other two comments provided in the management letter are comments that we always issue as a firm. Um, the first being when we have any funds over budget. I know the village policy is really to not amend the budget once it's set. Um, but certainly as the auditors, we think it's our responsibility to make sure that communication happens once a year. So we did have a handful of funds that were over that, that budgetary figure. So that's really an update or, or kind of a housekeeping comment. Um, and then the third item is we still have a fund that is in deficit position, that being the refuse fund. Although that did improve in 2019, it is still in fact in that deficit position. So we provided that update in the document as well. Any questions that I can answer for the board? Justin, any other highlights that you think need to be touched on this evening? Nope, I think you covered them very well. Good. Thank you. I know it's a lot to digest. <laughs> I was letting them di digest <laughs> yes, the Yes, and certainly if there's follow-up questions, um, Justin can certainly get you in touch with me as well. So I know there's a lot to take in in that large document. Awesome, well thank you, I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Any questions for her? Sure. Question for Justin. Uh, gaming rev tax looks like it's up like 30 some odd percent in two years. Did the village issue more licenses in the last two years? We went from 70 to 113,000 in gaming tax. <clears throat> um, the village doesn't actually issue the license licenses, the state does. Um, they get that by way of having a liquor license. Um, and so there have been additional um, entities, additional, whether it's a restaurant or what have you, um, that have uh, applied and received additional um, licenses. In addition to that, um, just each entity that has a license, we've seen those go up as well, so. Like the number of machines they have, is that what you're saying? Not the number of machines but the number, the amount that is being. So they're getting uh, more play. Yes. Okay. Yeah, just. Yeah. And that's else. actually a trend we've seen across many of yeah. our municipalities. Didn't the state increase the number you could have as well? I thought the state as part of the Gaming Act allowed you to add additional machines. Up to six, I think. Yeah, up to six machines. So it could be part of the trend sure. that somebody may have added an additional machine. I have a question, if I may. Sure. On in the management letter, uh, item two, funds over budget, we see a motor fuel tax item for last year. Uh, it's even, and for this year, it's in <laughs> excess of one hundred and sixteen thousand dollars. How did that happen? Is it because the state didn't take as much money as we thought? No, so uh, this is just a timing issue on this one. Um, we have to estimate every year when we're doing the budget um, when those expenditures are gonna happen. And so because uh, essentially spring came early this year, if you will, um, our uh, contractor was able to get out in April and actually had completed a fair amount of the road work in April versus it being in May. So. That's the, normally that would, expense would have been in May, okay. so. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and the detail of that is on page 123 of the larger document if you wanna see the MFT fund. <coughs> All right. Thank, Thank you very you. much, appreciate, appreciate it. it. I'm amazed.
day she could say it's page 123 I, of this. I'm thoroughly I mean, impressed with her knowledge of exactly wow. what pages all these things are on. I you, do this a lot. <laughs> is this the only one you do? No. <laughs> no. I, no. I think um, Justin and his crew deserve um, a lot of credit for having systems in place and, and, and things in order to allow such a clean audit. Um, I, I think, like it was alluded to, this is um, pretty fantastic for, for the agency um, with a budget this size and scope and scale and complexities that Justin's got his stuff in order and clearly is handling business appropriately and well. So kudos. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, with that, I'll move on to item F, which is a proclamation for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I would like to invite uh, Trustee Sperling to read this one. Thank you, President Brawley. Whereas since the awareness program began in 1985, mammography rates have more than doubled for women age 50 and older, and breast cancer deaths have declined. And whereas National Breast Cancer Awareness Month seeks to increase public knowledge about the importance of early detection and treatment of breast cancer. And whereas many women still do not utilize mammography at regular intervals, even though research indicates it is the best available method of detection. And whereas the National Cancer Institute estimates that in the United States, more than 230,000 new cases of breast cancer will be diagnosed this year and over 40,000 people will die. And whereas taking advantage of early detection methods such as mammography and clinical breast exams could help the breast cancer death rate drop by approximately 30%. And whereas the American Cancer Society and other organizations continue to search endlessly for a cure through vital research and to reduce the risks of breast cancer through community education. Now therefore, Matt, Matthew T. Brawley, Village President of the Village of Montgomery does hereby proclaim the month of October 2019 to be Breast Cancer Awareness Month in the Village of Montgomery and urges all women and their families to get the facts about breast cancer, support those courageously fighting breast cancer, and honor the lives lost to this devastating disease. I move to approve. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Go ahead. Trustee Sperling. Yes. Trustee Lee. Yes. Trustee Metzinger. Trustee Youngerman? Yes. Trustee Marisak? Yes. And Trustee Geyer? Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. All right. Uh, to speed things up a little bit, I will uh, forego reading the National Apprenticeship Week proclamation, entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Second. Go ahead. Trustee Marisak? Yes. Trustee Geyer? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Betzinger? Yes. And Trustee Youngerman? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, moving on to consent, we have three items. Uh, I'll read them. Entertain a motion for approval. Minutes of the village board meeting from October 14th. Accounts payable through October 24th. And the accounts receivable for September 2019. So moved. Second. Trustee Youngerman? Yes. Trustee Marisek? Yes. Trustee Geyer? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. And Trustee Betzinger? I carry 6 0. Thank you. Under items for separate action today, uh, item A is resolution 2019-014, approving the use of 2019 MFT <coughs> funds for snow removal mat materials. Dr. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. So before you tonight is the resolution to pass for MFT funding. Uh, this year currently the village went out for bid through the CMS pricing process um, at which we received our quotes back. Uh, the village is anticipating uh, purchase of 1,200 tons, which would be 80% of the total amount that we uh, requested for. So at this point in time, we'll be requesting uh, the approval of that resolution for the materials for snow removal for the 2019-2020 snow season. I have a question, if I may. Um, do we have any salt on hand from last year? Yes. We have roughly about 800 tons on hand from last year. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Wolf, I... I uh, have been following some of the other mun municipalities. I believe the price per ton has increased this year. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. It increased uh, quite a bit over the last year. Pretty we were paying 64.18 was our pricing last year. Uh, this year it took a significant jump to uh, 96.25. Yeah. 
Thank you. So pretty substantial, which is the bulk of the reason for us committing to our 80% instead of the 100% and or 120%. Uh, which is the agreement that we have with CMS. So we have the ability to take up to 80% uh, of our committed amount, which was 1,500 tons this year, um, or we can do as much as 20% over that amount. So at this point in time, due to that increase in price, uh, we're electing to only um, have to take 80% of our committed amount. If we commit to 80%, are they committed to providing 80%? Yes. Because I, I remember a couple years ago, weren't they out of salt? Or someone was out of salt and it took forever it was, to get salt? A river, a river froze. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was not a contractor issue. It was a global issue for the whole entire region because they couldn't get the salt here. Because the, yeah, the oh, barges like froze barge on the river. Yeah. Okay. So okay. It was a delivery issue. It wasn't that you couldn't get it. it you, you couldn't have it. You just couldn't get it. <laughs> so it's not like the mine was behind or something like that. It was a logistical issue. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? I move to approve. Second. Trustee Sperling. Yes. Trustee Lee. Yes. Trustee Betzinger. Yes. Trustee Youngerman. Trustee Marisak. Yes. And Trustee Geyer. Yes. I carry 6 0. Thank you. Uh, item B tonight is Ordinance 1866, establishing the expansion of and amendment to uh, SSA number 12. This is yellow transportation, uh, waiver of first and passage on the second reading. Direct Young. Thank you, Mr. President. This item uh, has long been waited for um, after many months and actually years of working with uh, the property owners within this area of special service area 12 were finally able to bring this forward to the village board with regards to the addition of the yellow freight property or yellow transportation property to uh, TIF area 12. Uh, it's important because this services the uh, detention facility that's in that region at the end of Rochester Road in conjunction with some other properties that are across uh, Rochester Road. So we ask uh, for board approval at this time. All right, any questions for staff? I just want to clarify, did you just say adding it to TIF area 12? Special service area 12, if I said TIF, I apologize. That's okay, it's what did I, I said. I got confused. It's oh, I apologize, <laughs> uh, special service <laughs> area 12. <laughs> Thank you. And we did, we already held a public hearing on this, correct? Yes, sir. No comment. No. And all of the property owners that are being added to this are fully aware of this? Yes. And do we know, have it roughly um, what the yearly charge would be on this SSA or is it backup? It's not just a backup. Okay. Um, correct? It's, it's oh, I'm sorry. It's proposed as being a backup. I Perfect. apologize. Okay. Any other questions other than mine? All right. Moved. Is there a second? I'll second. There you go. <laughs> Trustee Marisak? Yes. Trustee Geyer? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Betzinger? Yes. And Trustee Youngerman? Yes. And that carries 6 0. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, um, we'll handle these separately, but we will discuss them together. The next two items we have uh, Plan Commission recommendation of uh, PC 2019 0. <coughs> 13Z. It's a text amendment to the zoning ordinance regarding cannabis-related businesses. And then uh, item D, ordinance 1867, which is the approving ordinance, and it's only first reading of that today. So with that, I will ask whoever looks at me next to give a summary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as you're aware, the plan commission at their last meeting uh, took up the issue of the new state legislation that will allow cannabis businesses to be uh, placed in Illinois as of uh, January 1st of next year. And what this amounts to is, as we've talked about previously in discussion uh, with the Village Board, there's a series of different types of businesses that are associated with the new state's state legislation that could be allowed either as a permitted use, as a special use, or prohibited within the village under our zoning ordinance. So we're talking about dispensing organizations, uh, which 
may include craft growers, which is a smaller version of a production type operation or cultivation center, separate cultivation centers of a larger scale, infusing organizations, um, processing organizations, which, which actually uh, can cross a couple different types of uh, business operations, and then transportation organizations, which could include what the state legislation allows for now would be a, a community college-based uh, vocational training program. With that, the village staff took a look at these types of businesses and what the appropriate zoning, uh, what we felt would be the appropriate zoning districts to include these uh, operations in if it was the desire of the village board to do so. We took the um, dispensing organization and felt that that was more of a uh, commercial type operation and looked at that in terms of our four commercial zoning districts and said it would be most appropriate in the B2 and the B3, the highest uh, level commercial zoning district as a special use. And we made that recommendation to the plant commission and they agreed with that uh, recommendation. Similarly, the other businesses are more industrial in nature uh, those being the cultivation center, the infusion organization, uh, processing organization, and transportation, along with craft growers. Uh, we felt that that would be more appropriate in uh, our industrial districts. We have two, M1 and M2, and again, as a special use, meaning that you would have to have a public hearing, go before the plan commission, and then a recommendation to the village board along with the fact that you have to, a business of this type would have to um, receive a state license as well. Um, in conjunction with that, we felt that it was appropriate to have type, some type of a setback from what we've deemed sensitive areas, such as uh, residential areas, uh, uh, schools, public parks, and the like. And we've set in our proposed uh, ordinance uh, 500 feet as a setback to any sensitive areas. As we've reviewed with the plan commission and have used at, and you have seen a map that outlines areas that would be allowed to have these types of businesses in both the B1, I'm sorry, in the B2 and the B3 zoning designations for a dispensing organization and then the other business types within M1 and M2 how they would be located in terms of a 500 foot setback from uh, deemed sensitive areas. And that does very much limit the areas that could incorporate these types of businesses. In addition, we talked about with the plan commission, the idea of uh, limited hours and felt that it was most appropriate to limit the hours or set the hours of operations for these types of businesses as each individual business came in for their special use. So that's been worked into the draft ordinance in terms of a determination on hours of operation based on the business itself as it's reviewed under the special use uh, standards. The one thing that has not been addressed in the ordinance, which um, we did talk about with the plan commission was how to uh, prohibit any type of on-site consumption of products that would be generated from um, any types of these businesses. And if we move forward with the village board on approval of this text amendment ordinance for the zoning ordinance, we would incorporate a location within the zoning ordinance that states that any of these uh, types of businesses would not be able to include on-site consumption like a lounge or a showroom or whatever you'd like to call it in terms of either a retail or a production type setting. So uh, that will be included if we move forward with the final draft of the, of the ordinance. So with all that said, the plan commission did recommend to approve text amendment to the zoning ordinance to incorporate these businesses as a special use, uh, as I've outlined in either the B2, B3, M1 or M2 zoning districts. Awesome, thank you. I'm certain that people have comments and questions. Would, uh, would the board be interested in acting on item C, the plan commission recommendation prior to that discussion? Sure, so moved. Bye. Bye. 
Trustee Youngerman? Yes. Trustee Marisak? Tr <laughs> Excuse me. Youngerman? Youngerman? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Oh, and yes. Trustee Marisak? Trustee Geyer? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. And Trustee Betzinger? Yes. All right. Now, are there questions for staff? I have a few, please. Um, my first, uh, my I notice everything else is in my packet is black and white and the pot ordinance is green. Is that by design? Is that a little pot humor? No, sir. No? That's okay. Uh, next, my question is for the chief. Has the state come up with any sort of field sobriety testing or anything yet? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, in the law enforcement aspect, the field sobriety testing is not going to change. You're still going to have to pass the standard field sobriety test. They have developed some new technologies for breath testing, um, but right now those are very expensive, uh, just not only for the apparatus, but each use. So we're just going to go along right now with the rest of the organizations in the state and go with blood um, and use that as our, our testing apparatus. But you have ways of, if someone is, is over whatever legal limit is decided, you, the, the police department has ways of determining that at this point? Guidelines to, to go by? Well, and I, I, I'm hitting on what Trustee Sperling said last time. I think a lot of us were for this and we're, we're interested in the medical possibilities and those sorts of things with that. Um, I agree with what uh, Trustee Sperling said as far as I don't want someone to go into a retail operation and be able to partake and then get in their vehicle. I don't want it consumed on premise. I don't care if they consume it at home. You know, we, we don't have anything to do with that. But I don't want it consumed on premise. So I'm, I'm glad that Rich had said something that, that is going to be that way. But as long as there's something and you've got guidelines, because when I asked you this last time, there weren't a whole lot of guidelines. I think the state just made a money grab. They, they didn't really think this through. <coughs> All they are interested in is in the taxes. They don't, they're leaving it up to the municipalities really to kind of work out the, the kinks in this thing. Um, but as long as you're telling me that we've got a guideline or guidelines in place where an officer can deem someone over the limit and they can, there's a judicial process for that, I'm fine with that. And is that what you're telling me? Yes, we're gonna treat it just as we did alcohol. Um, okay. If they're impaired, they're impaired. We'll place them under arrest and put them through the test. And it's similar to the, any sort of um, drug enforcement operation that you currently have. Nothing has changed, correct? Because it's not like you... No, sir. Yeah. So this, just like with any law that takes effect, you know, on January 1st, 2020, it would be incumbent upon our police department and the chief to figure out how best equipped we can be if there's any financial impact that the village needs, the board needs to be concerned with, then obviously he'd bring that forward. Um, and so we'll be ready to go January 1. Aside from that is this zoning regulation, whether or not we want, want the operations to um, locate here in town. So it's twofold, but it's a, good, it's a point well, well taken. And I think the board was unanimous in not, in, in not being interested in, correct me if I'm wrong, in uh, consumption operations anywhere in the village. That would be um, not in our ordinances. So, any I, other questions? Yeah, I got one. Uh, the restrictions um, on the PC 219 amendment keeps our, uh, at least keeps us in, for special use in certain areas, which I like. But I'm going back to my old classmate, Bob O'Connor from Aurora, that said basically what Steve said is that JB pass this for money, taxes, and that's all they're interested in. Somewhat I think Aurora's doing it too for money revenue issues. But I would like to see if, if we're gonna have this, I'd like to see our money go to help the police department. In other words, not take it into our general fund like Aurora's gonna do, like the state of Illinois is gonna do. I think you're gonna come up with some some uh, problems that 
that nobody really looked into yet. We, we, I don't know what the problems are going to be yet, but Cal Colorado sure got them, and I'm sure we're going to have somewhat like they have. So I don't mind passing this kind of stuff, but it's really not, uh, I think it's not all revenue. It's going to be. So what you're saying is that you want the drug users to help fund the program. Right, for the drug users. No, and not use drugs. Right. Okay. Right. Just uh, as a side note, my recollection is that the state statute has a revenue provision in it that is reserved for just that, and it's to be distributed to all municipalities in Illinois, regardless of whether they opt in or opt out. And it's okay. to be used for, Chief, help me out here. My recollection is to be used for drug um, education. prevention education. activities. Drug awareness and education. Drug yes, awareness. Sir. I would still like to see how he figures <clears throat> people are going to, what percentage are going to get. I'm sure people down in some farm town in southern Illinois has none, and they're not going to get the same amount, I doubt, as if they do, it, it'd be great for them, but no, it's not I'm, good I'm for I'm just saying that's done independently <coughs> of right. any action that Montgomery but, takes. But I still think we should have something to make sure, too, because we are in the middle of a drug area I mean there's no doubt about that yeah and so and if a use came in basically it would only be the retail use that we would have tax on we we could at that time decide to open up a, um, a line item in our budget for the PD and put that money in there as a revenue um, but until we have a, a retail use in town we would have no tax that reminds me we talked briefly about the um, local tax that we can levy on this. Would that ordinance follow this one? That ordinance would follow this one because um, we didn't want to get ahead of ourselves in yeah. terms of the taxation ordinance component, which we can go up to 3% with a separate tax on top of our general uh, sales tax. So that would come forward later if uh, the board decides to move forward with the zoning component. And can we m approve those on the same evening then? If at the same could meeting? We, you sure could you certainly the could. Waiver, waiver first on let's, the tax ordinance. let's put those on for a future meeting to do that. And I think, and pardon me if I'm talking too quickly. Yeah, wait, there, what? Uh, what did you just say? So, what there, so here's the use. We're talking <coughs> zoning today. Yeah. There's also a tax component okay. that I would like us to take action on at the same meeting as this so it's we're making oh, gotcha. okay. the same votes on the same night um, we haven't talked about that yet really other than our initial conversation a few months ago I'd like to have Rich look that up because people have been putting in the paper that even if we pass one you can't collect it to like 2022 or some it's something to do with that because it's I've seen it yeah. in the paper where the Justin, the Justin's looked into that. I believe that if we had a business in place, which it's unlikely that we'd have a business in place January 1st, but what is the lag time? Isn't it six to nine months in terms of collection? Actually, the um, state has said that they will not actually um, start collecting taxes for any municipalities until I think it's October of 2020. So even if there is something in town on January 1st, the taxes aren't going to be there. So we go 10 months without being able to collect any tax on this? Well, they have to generate the tax first. They to generate to the tax to, first. Yes. And then there's the Springfield delay that seems to happen on everything for us to get the funding back. It's very unlikely you would have even an application right. by January of 2020. But if, if there was, is... Is the state just saying, I don't care if you've got a location that wants to start in January of 2020, we're not going to collect any tax on it until October? We still have to get through your special use process. Yeah, so I, I can't answer that, but we won't have that issue. So you get tax-free pop for the first 10 months. It, it's very unlikely that we're going to see something uh, applied for in the next few months. And even if we did, they still have to go through the state license component and my understanding is is that there's a limited number within the first year of state licenses that will be issued and what i've been also told is that many of those will go to the companies that already have 
the medical marijuana, or I'm sorry, medical cannabis uh, business licenses from the state. So it's unlikely that we would see something that quickly. It's, uh, sure, it's possible, but. So there's an opportunity then for if, if the state is now handing out the licenses for them to play favorites and say, okay, you can get some of these and you can get some, you don't get any of these because we all know how. Well, quite, quite frankly, we control what we control and we don't control the state. That's right. So the hand wringing and the but doesn't mean anything to us. We can't control it. We don't have control of their process. We have control of ours. We set up the ordinance. We make a plan. <clears throat> That's what we can deal with. I, I understand that, but I mean, the fact is the state hasn't thought anything through. Again, we have no control over, over what they have or have not done right now. What we're trying to recommend to the board is we either make a decision as a community to include these types of businesses in our zoning ordinance or not. And so that we're ready and we're prepared that if we do have an application for a business of this type, we know how to handle it. If our ordinance is just silent on it, we don't have the ability to deal with it either one way or the other. And that's why as this is set up, it's heavily controlled. It is a special use that would come before a plan commission and the village board. And um, it would be set up a lot like our liquor uh, where there isn't an ordinance available or there's n no license available and we would have to thus grant one based on the circumstances. I have a couple of comments and now I'm trying to remember them all as we went. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention, uh, we had a state representative come in and speak with us at Rotary and I did talk to her about the state, the uh, law that's coming into effect. And she had mentioned they are going to do some cleaning up. Not the way I would like to see it cleaned up, of course, um, but I specifically asked about there being some type of standard set for police enforcement um, in terms of indicating whether somebody has above a certain limit, things like that. But they're, they're planning to do a little bit of cleanup um, during the veto session. Yes, yeah. yes, so I just, I wanted to mention that. I forgot the second thing I wanted to mention. I might have to come back to that. Oh, I know. So again, I've been following what a lot of the surrounding municipalities are doing, which normally I don't really pay that much attention to it because I, I like to just focus on Montgomery. What is concerning me is we're going to end up with this patchwork of what's allowed where uh, in terms of the setbacks, I'm hearing different setbacks in different communities. Um, again, it, it's just, and I understand what Trustee Betzinger was saying too, we control what we control. It, it's very troubling to me. I'm, I'm really, really uncomfortable with what I'm hearing. Uh, I did just recently read that DuPage County has completely banned it, which means Everyone's for, going to be funneling out of yeah. DuPage County that to would the be surrounding for unincorporated areas, so not in no. cities. Right. Not in this. So it's okay. So it's not for the whole thing. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, patchwork. Yeah, and it, right. you know what? It's it's probably very similar to uh, local liquor ordinances. I, I can't think of one, but I'm sure there's a town in our state that doesn't sell liquor. Uh, yeah, but you used wouldn't. To be that one. <laughs> Who? Wheaton. Wheaton. Used to be that one. <laughs> so you just wouldn't notice it, you wouldn't buy there, but again, and this is this is a lot reactionary. The state made a decision for all of us, and now it's our job yes. to figure out how best we can um, control and regulate that so that it's uh, in the best interest of our community. So this is what we have to control. I know that Metro West uh, was working on and holding uh, seminars, so like North Aurora currently has a facility, um, and so they needed to be up and running uh, very early with their ordinance to allow that, Otherwise, that business would have to shut down. Um, so there's a lot of people looking at this. There is a bunch of cleanup that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to watch all of this uh, over the next year or more to see how things play out. And if we need to update or adapt our ordinance uh, so that meets kind of our needs locally. The, um, the other thing I wanted to point out, 
Uh, yesterday, I happened to catch a story that was on 60 Minutes. No, I was not watching football, but it just happened to catch my attention. I don't know if anyone else saw it, but they were talking about the um, cannabis regulations in California and the chaos that it's creating there. And we know they were an early adopter. Uh, they're talking something like seven years before they're seeing what the intention was in terms of finances. Um, they also have a huge black market for growing because the people that are doing it the proper way and seeking the permits and going through all of the hoops to do, to do this legally, it's costing them so much money, they're not making any type of profit, and now their black market has gone through the roof, and they have some ridiculous amount of surplus of cannabis in the state, and they're, they're only allowed to sell it in the state, but obviously that's not happening. It's being exported out of the state. So that, that made me hesitant to want to have any type of processing or growing here in Montgomery, obviously we're you know just a little tiny square on the map compared to California. I don't want to see that type of thing happen, and I'm also uh, really just concerned about we don't know how this is going to play out. And I've said it before when we've had some other things come in. I'm not really interested in gambling with our residents or the quality of life that's here. So I'm, I'm just, I'm feeling very hesitant now about moving forward with this. And whether we adopt a zoning ordinance to allow this or adopt a zoning ordinance to ban it, um, it will still be here. Our residents right. would still have the opportunity to drive to North Aurora, drive anywhere to buy that. Our police department would still um, need to enforce the, the, these regulations. What we would, could potentially be missing out on was any retail or new development in our TIF area mm -hmm. uh, or any area, and, but I understand your concern. I think this right. is, things are kind of in flux right now. Um, yes. Not kind of, I mean, the, the vast majority of the bill that was passed, I suspect will stay the same. Mm -hmm. There will be tweaks to fix some portions of that, I'm sure. Um, but again, can, we control what we can, and that, right. that would be zoning and how many licenses we have available. So I guess, just to clarify, I guess I'm, I'm leaning toward not having the production and the infusing and cultivating these, uh, la the last four that you have listed here in this recommendation. Um, the dispensing, again, I, I, I don't think we really can get away. I mean, people are gonna use whatever they wanna use. They're going to use it in their home. And like you said, the police are going to have to deal with people who use it and drive. I just don't want us to end up in a situation, again, I realize we're on a much smaller scale than California, but it was something I hadn't thought of. And it just, it brought it to the forefront for me. Yeah. Yes, that they weren't anticipating that happening. It was supposed to be a gold mine for the, for the state of California. And it's not happened. Right. So... Just to push back on that slightly, sure. um, if somebody was going to invest in um, a building in our community in, let's say, on Alcott Road or potentially a much larger facility, and I'm not saying, I'm not foreshadowing, I have no idea. Right. Uh, millions upon millions of dollars to open up um, a facility in our community, and, and that goes bad, just like any business. We wouldn't thus say, I don't want that particular use whatever it is, cannabis, tires, anything. We wanna ban that in our community because we are unsure as to the future of that business and that whole industry. We would say, if you're going to build a nice um, investment in our community, we would be supportive of that generally. Regardless yes. of, you know, obviously there's lots of the hoops, but if somebody's gonna come in and build a $5 million uh, building in our Alcott Road area, I think that would be a solid investment in the long-term benefit for the village. We don't get any tax out of that other than the property tax from that building. That would, but again, there's no sales tax associated with that and there's no consumption or sales from it. And the same way with employees, 
you'd have more employees working there and that type yeah. of thing. I, and I can see what you say that North Aurora is going to have one. Mm -hmm. They're going to buy there. They're going to come here. He's still got to chase them. Uh, so we might as well get the three percent uh, where the guy would buy it here, and Phil could still chase them. It, it's just, uh, but I just want to make sure the money we get, the taxes, we're not throwing in the general fund. I wanted to use for Phil to chase them. I mean, chasing money, basically. Yeah, I agree with Trustee Lee on the ordinance that you want to uh, present at the next board meeting <clears throat> on the sales taxes. That the ordinance we would put in that it would specifically go to a separate fund and not in the general fund. Yeah, how would that work? How would we do that? It's more than you can put in your special fund. We could also earmark it in the general fund. I mean, we do that with other things. We'll talk. We'll okay. I guess we'll yeah, I just talk about that as a group. Yeah, right. So it. the question is, is 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 much like we did with the um, um, with the uh, sales tax yes. for roads. I mean, are we going to put that in the ordinance that we we vote on it that we want the money to be separated and used for specific use only? I don't know what Phil's going to use it for. If he needs a, a dog or if he yeah, needs a car. If, so if I, I don't a, know if you'd be specific on where it goes or if it can't always go to just police department. Right. I just say some of it. Yeah, yeah. how's about this? Um, let's put in the ordinance that it would be earmarked in a, in a um, line item for revenue. And then it would be a policy decision on a yearly or whatever basis for the board to determine uh, what buckets that needs to go in. Lar you know, largely police. Could go towards school and um, you know drug education um, that kind of thing whatever it is that we would need to do but at least then we know the amount it's on I mean it would be under its separate uh, line item anyway in the revenue I mean that's just my opinion because okay. we don't know exactly where it's where it's what bucket we need that in um, right I just don't want it to get lost in, yes in the general fund. I'm with you yeah. but when we do this and if and when we do this we tax it to the maximum uh, I have another question. On the transporting organization, uh, transportation operation which delivers cannabis on behalf of a cannabis business establishment or community college licensed under the community college cannabis vocational training pilot program, is there going to be any sort of like a special license or a driver's license? How are those people going to be identified? Because if you pull a car over and they've got six pounds of pot, how are, how's that identified? The business will have to have a license to have that type of business in the, in the state. So the transportation organization, if it's just a trucking company, as I understand it, would have to have that cannabis uh, transportation license or that cannabis business license from the state. So it's not going to be a guy in a, a minivan <laughs> All of a sudden, we pull him over, and oh, he's minivan. got ten pounds of pot in the back. I, point well taken, Chief. Do you have something to add on, on that, or? Well, it very well could be, um, but Director Young has it on the head. There will be a license applied to a company that is in charge of the transportation. That being said, when you transport as individual, it needs to be sealed, and it will have a state seal on it, and you can't have that open while you're transporting within your vehicle. So there, you're talking about someone that is actually tasked and licensed with the transportation of large quantities, and then you have the individual user. So it's the company and the individual with the large quantities that's gonna have a license. Well, I'm sure there are individual user, users that have large quantities that are... Well, that would, yeah. But there's, a, you would be, there's limitations yes. within the law for that. And I think the license would be no different than you have to have a license to do hazardous material transportation. You have to have a license. So it'd be to like be an able, OSHA card or something like that. You have that. to have a okay. license to be able to transport. As, as long that. as there's something identifiable, that if I get pulled over, okay, here's my my license to transport type of thing. Here's my card. I'm okay with that. But if it's yeah. something different, no. I'm thinking that it would be just like that. It would be like just like if you want to haul hazardous materials, you have to have a certain license. To be able essentially to do a so. business license. Yeah, and but if you're carry, if you're driving around with six pounds of cannabis in the back of your car, then you got a problem because there's limitations as to how much you can transport for personal use. Okay, you put a big leaf on your hood of your car, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I like about you, Danny. <laughs> Anybody else have any comments? All right, so let's add this to a future meeting. I would like to do both ordinances at the same time, so however long that takes, and we'll go from there. If you have any other questions or comments, please get them to uh, staff before the next meeting. Thank you. Or at future meeting. All right. Moving on, uh, we have uh, one item for discussion this evening. It's the uh, Sustainable Initiatives Quarterly Update. Senior Here's planner. Cover this for me, yep. so. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Uh, this before you this evening. There we go. Uh, is the sustainable uh, initiatives quarterly update. So this is something that we want to uh, start to implement as staff to bring forward to you. Uh, quarterly updates about green and sustainable initiatives that the village is undertaking. Uh, part of this is prompted by our uh, joining the Greenest Regions 2 compact earlier in the summer. So we were the 100th uh, signee to that compact. So uh, we're quite excited about that. And uh, we're excited to look through uh, the Greenest Regions compact and start to focus on uh, implementing more of those items. However, I did want to cover several of the items that we are already doing. Some of them relate directly to the Greenish Regions Compact. Others are somewhat ancillary to it. Uh, village staff has been working to install an electronic vehicle charging station on River Street near Village Hall. Uh, you may have seen the progress in regards to that. It's not quite complete yet, but uh, we're working on it. Uh, we. Uh, this item was approved in January, it is a collaboration with Kane County. And please note that we'll be working on scheduling a ribbon cutting for this in the future. Uh, one of the Kane County committees is very excited uh, to come down and be present at a ribbon cutting, primarily because this is the first partnership that they have had uh, outside of installing the charging stations at their own locations. So they want to use this. Uh, as a template for future installations. Uh, the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus uh, has been working towards a community solar program for, uh, for municipalities. The village has fulfilled all the application requirements and is awaiting the result of the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, the caucus's supplier outreach and qualifications process. Once the village receives more information regarding the program, it will be able to, to make a final decision regarding whether to join the program. The program would save the village money on its electric, electric vehicle, or excuse me, on its electric utility bills by purchasing solar powered energy, or solar generated, er generated energy. Uh, as you are aware, earlier in the summer, we had a short presentation regarding uh, the Soul Smart Gold Award. Uh, this has created a very fast permitting process uh, for the village to permit new solar rooftop energy systems. Uh, the village has issued 91 of those systems uh, so far this calendar year. Uh, the village has also entered into a memo of understanding with the Kane County, with Kane County in support of their bike share uh, request for proposals. Uh, the county is currently interviewing and choosing a vendor for the program. Once the vendor is cho chosen, specific costs and details regarding the program will be shared with those that expressed interest. Uh, the village will be able to decide whether to be a part of the final program once those details are provided. The bike share program is intended to allow people to rent bikes from a static station and drop it off at the same station or at others throughout the network. And I believe there were uh, 13 or 14 memos of understanding submitted to the county for this. So there's some uh, good interest in this program. Uh, I'd also like to bring to your attention that um, I'm on a committee with the Fox Valley Sustainability Network. This is a network that uh, works towards educating the public about different sustainable and green uh, initiatives and their next meeting is November, or their next forum, excuse me, is November 21st, uh, is in regards to energy efficiency in the built environment. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Awesome. 
Thank you. Any questions for Jared? And one of the other items that we have been working on is the change out of our um, street light bulbs. I don't know if that that's directly falls under there, but. That's very true. Thank you. Comment Grant. All right. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. All right. Hearing no other comments, I'll move on. Thank you, Jared. Um, <laughs> under new or unfinished business, I know Trustee Geyer had something. Yep, I've got uh, three announcements and, and a question. Um, for beautification, uh, the entryway signs, uh, the 13 have been replaced throughout the village. <clears throat> There's two additional signs that Public Works is working on this uh, week. Uh, it's a sign uh, on Briarcliff. They're right off of 30 by the tennis courts. And then on Douglas uh, by Taco Bell. <clears throat> um, I, I can't believe how fast they put these up. Uh, Mark, if you would thank uh, the staff over there for all their hard work, and they jumped right on this, and I, I, I thought it would be well into next year, but they really did a great job of getting these up quickly and before uh, before the freezing weather hit. Um, yes. I just wanted to say the signs look really good. Thank you. I've been coming in different directions into the village, and they look really good. Okay. So thank you. Yeah, nice I've, I've received a lot of a lot of different compliments on them too. So I appreciate that. <coughs> um, we did have our Halloween judging. Uh, Fifty nine properties were recognized. Um, for their efforts. <clears throat> we uh, are uh, having a um, beautification meeting next week, and we will be talking about the holiday decoration judging, which is coming up pretty quick. Uh, the deadline for nominations is December 8th, and we will be judging on December 11th. Mm -hmm. And that's the big one for us. We usually get around 120 properties. And um, that's it for announcements. And I, I do have one question, and I've seen in the, uh, the press here recently about IDOT releasing some funding. <clears throat> and if anybody has any specifics on that, I, the, the paper had reported that it was Route 30 between 47 and Albright, and then some work on a bridge off of River Street. I don't know if that's a Mill Street bridge or... Nothing exciting, frankly. No? The Most of the release that we saw in the Capitol Bill was for maintenance items uh, on those routes. Um, I can send you a copy of the uh, release that was done for the Capitol Bill. Okay, so no... Nothing major. So, yeah, <laughs> all of our efforts um, over years, and we just recently sent a letter back to IDOT again talking about or the importance of Orchard and 30. Um, the reality is, apparently, the unfunded, just regular maintenance for the IDOT system, it has been so poor over the last X number of years that we were not even included in their five year plan. Wow. So, it's unclear at this moment, whether or not that's the entire capital bill funding or if that was just the MFT increase or what that was, and I don't know if you know that, Pete. Um, and so there potentially could still be opportunities for us to, to receive funding for the full intersection. But at the same time, and I think this also highlights how important it is that um, we move forward with Kane County last year to do the phase two engineering for the interim improvements. Um, and when that gets completed, I believe at the end of next year, maybe some point in 2020, um, we need to we need to consider uh, a funding stream for the interim improvements themselves, uh, and that would probably end up being a local uh, program or submitted through the uh, Kane Kendall Council of Mayors. However, we'd have to find funding for that. Right. The intention was to. Um submit for a CMAC grant, a congestion mitigation, air quality grant. I think that's the avenue that would be taken by, and that's being led by King County Department of Transportation. So Jeff. hopefully um, later this year or next year, we'll have some sort of an update from Kane County as to where the engineers are on the phase two for that intersection, but um, outside of those interim improvements, Okay. That's currently all we have funded, and it's, yeah, dis was, it's disappointing. Yeah, there was another accident at Orchard and 30 today at 3 o'clock. So. Yeah, and we shared, so I don't know if the board saw a copy of that letter, but the updated letter that we sent to the Secretary of Transportation uh, included tr uh, accident and fatality data for that intersection um, along with some other information. So, yes, it's frustrating. <laughs> Jeff, when I spoke to you about this earlier this week, you said you were going to set up a meeting with Keith. Has that meeting been set up? We're still working, trying to find a date. Okay. Please let us know when you do, please. I just wanted to build on that, too, when we had the uh, state rep visit us from Rotary. Well trained. Talked to her about that, too. I said, that's what we need. She said, what can I do for you guys? What do you need? I said, well, let's talk. 
Well, and if, and if you recall, that was on our short list of conversation topics uh, for Steve Anderson down in Springfield. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see kind of how far that got. I think the, the bigger picture reality is that their state roadway system is in such poor shape mm -hmm. that our project doesn't rank that as high as some others. Um, but that's frustrating. Um, we'll continue conversations with our state reps. Uh, more importantly, there's um, some committee heads that we were trying to set up some meetings with. I'm on the CMAP board and the MPO with the IDOT secretary. Um, and so next month um, or the month after, I'll be in a meeting with him. Hopefully we can keep chirping because reality is um, it's frustrating. That was a frustrating day. Anything more uplifting, Dan? Yeah. No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've got something. I'm, I'm going to start it, and I'll let everybody else finish. Uh, I had some kids that I sent to our Halloween function at the police station, and as they said, their kids had a blast, and they really thought it was great. I know Doug was more active than I was, but I want to at least tell the chief that the that they, they really enjoyed all the policemen dressed up and, and that thing, but they, they really had a blast. Even though the weather was cold, I had a couple say they grabbed the candy and ran or something, but uh, <laughs> some went through the whole 10 little spots and just thoroughly enjoyed it. it you know, to dovetail into that, yeah, would, my hat's off to the entire staff over at the police department. I know Commander Palco and Ada do a tremendous job of organizing it, but every one of those officers is there volunteering. They volunteer their time. There's nobody there on overtime. Everybody's there as a volunteer. And from the games they built to coming in costumes, and I happened to be um, at a slide presentation. The chief showed us several slides from the Halloween presentation. And when you can see the officers in the background, so they, were, they didn't know they were in the picture. The smiles on their faces as they're interacting with all of these kids, it's an entirely different level of community policing because we're talking to these kids when they're little and the way that they engage them and talk to them about the safety tips is invaluable. Um, they really take the opportunity to do something fun and make it educational and also raise and heighten the awareness and respect for the police department. So again, hats off to everybody over at the PD that is involved and helps put that together and you're embracing it and supporting it has been fantastic. So thank you. And then on a separate note, um, I have been, I've joined the Citizens Police Academy, as Chief put it, class 01, the first class. Um, and as I spoke to the Chief earlier tonight, the information that we're receiving is just unbelievable. It, it truly is, so I really highly encourage anybody that wants to learn more about the law enforcement and police department and the inner workings to sign up for that, for to become a part of class of O2. Um, the knowledge is great, and to just learn and some, see some of the behind the scenes things. And again, thank you for opening up the building to us and welcoming us. Uh, even within our group, there's already a camaraderie developing and just some great friendships are going to come out of this 10-week class. So highly recommend it. Have you guys elected a class president yet, Doug? No. <laughs> <laughs> Have you announced your candidacy? The, the very first thing that was I was informed of is that I'm not allowed to speak. <laughs> I believe the Chief, Armando, Commander Diaz, and Commander Palco all, I think, chimed in with that one at some point during that first it's meeting. unanimous? Yeah, good. Yeah. They set the tone very quickly. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anything else? Anybody? I'm not saying anything tonight. I just, everybody can. Thank you. Look at the little Wisconsin footballs. lost. Thank you. All right, I'll just move on. Uh, future meetings, we have the future village board meeting it will be on November 12th. Note that that's Tuesday, because Monday is Veterans Day. So we'll be here on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Um, Jeff will be reminding you. And then um, with that, he just reminded you. With that, we'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn into executive session to discuss the employment of an employee. So moved. Second. 
Trustee Youngerman? Yes. Trustee Marisek? Yes. Trustee Geyer? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. And Trustee Betzinger? Yes. All right, we're adjourned. Thank you. Okay.